How's that? There we go. See, pilot error. I tell you what, I'm glad I wasn't flying. Because pilot error is an absolute, breathtaking, stunning thing. And that's why they always say, get altitude. <laughs> get altitude. I see that as our spiritual quest, is to get altitude. Because we're going to make some mistakes. And you want a little time to recover before you go splat. <laughs> right? And my instructor one time, and he said, you know... You have an engine trouble. I am. He reaches up and grabs the key and turns it off and pulls it out and put it in his pocket. Yep, you are. You better find you a place to land, son. <laughs> that guy had lots of fun with me. We were over some heavy wooded area and lake areas, but far, far in the distance, something he had already seen is, okay, we are up about 15,000. This kid can... If he sees it, maybe he can glide to that field, even though it's maybe 10 miles away. He's going to have to be on his toes and sharp. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. I was sweating bullets to get there. I looked around and, yeah, oh, there's a It's too far. I said, well, what you going to do, kid? <laughs> I was a kid. I was 16. And finally, when we got down to 5,000 feet, he said, well, you know what? All your circuits are working and all that stuff. And he sticks the key back in. And, and, and I reach up to start the engine. He, oh, no, your starter's out. I thought, oh, oh. See, one thing after another. I, he said, how are you going to start your engine? I had to put it in a dive to start an engine and lose another 2,000 feet. Sometime, there are some things that we do in life that we have to put it in a dive to get out of it, to get the spiritual engine going again, to get started to go again, to, to get things going again. But what it amounts to is planning out for the mistakes that we make. We are dumb as a brick. We make some mistakes. But if you've got enough altitude, you spend enough time up there with God, then when you... You, wait a minute, the world's turning around and you've got enough room to pull it out. You've got enough room. Now, I know there are some Christians that just are stunt flyers. They love to go up high, especially in our charismatic realm, and then the next time you see them, they're in a spin. Our pursuit of God is to get higher and higher and higher going from glory to glory to glory, learning to listen to the spiritual engine which is going to drive us, spiritual engine which is going to give us lift, a spiritual engine we must tend, a spiritual engine we must put the fuel in so that we grow. We've got to get to the environment of growth. We need sustained growth. Sustained growth. Something that keeps happening perpetually week by week by week. If I find that those who have sustained growth and they're fed on a regular basis, there's little trips and falls all along the way. But the recovery time is just right back on their feet. No broken heart, no going through six weeks of depression, no going through that, I'll never get it, no going through that, I'll never be worthy. Well, when were you ever worthy? <laughs> That's part of the problem. What, 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 you know, you borrow somebody else's brain. When, we, when did you get worthy? <laughs> That's why Jesus came. He knew that we'd be making mistakes, and that's why he sent the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit could instruct us and teach us and build us up, you know, build up the muscles and stuff as we've go been going through Sunday, our, our study on being built up. We're looking in this session in the book of Revelation, Oh my goodness, we've seen so many exciting times. We've seen the world come to an end. We've seen God's creative power make a new heaven and a new earth. And we're standing there just like the spirit of wisdom was. There's a passage in scripture that says, I wisdom. I was standing there watching when he stretched out his arm and he made that. When he drew a line in the sand and told the waters they could. I was there when he pushed up the mountains. We're going to be there. And he makes a new heaven and earth. And we're going to be excited and be testifying and talking. Hey, did you see that range over there when he did that? Man, that thing. 
We are going to be talking about so many mysteries because we get to behold them firsthand of our living God at work. Not only that, but we get to join him. We get to be a part of him. Not only that, but we have great things to do in his kingdom that he'll be placing us in positional relationship and functionality with him of being in his holy city and even helping rule planet earth we're going to look at some of those scriptures that are coming our way in this session but if we're going to see that our hearts have to be open to be able to receive from our lord and our master i cannot help you i'm a mere man but his word is nothing mere it is life it is radiant light and I'm not kidding you, a donkey, if he could speak his word, would bring revelation enough for us to see God if it was God's words that we heard coming out of his mouth. So, you pray that you can hear from a donkey in this session. Lord, I love you. You are so funny and so sweet. I ask you to open your word up to us and bring light and life from it and bring hope and transforming power from the Holy Spirit. But these are spiritual things, and we are not spiritual people. We do not abide as we should and could in your Spirit. Forgive us of that trespass, and help us be mindful that that is your way, that you are a spiritual God, and you're trying to get us to become spiritual. Help us latch on to that thought and never stop flying upward to move more in your spirit that we might behold you more. Now come and open our ears. Forgive us of our trespasses. And Lord, use me as your vessel. And let no person hear what I have to say, but only what you have to say. In Jesus' great and profound name I pray. Amen. Amen. We've seen Revelation nineteen twenty. 21 and 22, it's just a, a sequences of magnificent events of, of Jesus winding up the clock. The great city has been made and it has descended out of the heavens. Everything has already been burned up in a fever and heat. Every enemy of God has been dealt with. Anything that's resistant, every evil has been removed. And there's nothing now that's contaminated in the universe, with the exception of one thing. Anybody know what that is? The pit. The pit, the lake of fire. He said it would burn forever and ever and ever and ever. It's the only thing I can find in Scripture that doesn't pass away. And he says it will be seen forever and ever and ever. And I don't understand the concept of that when he says, Behold, I'm making everything new. I think it's because he wants to make everything new, but leave it as a reminder for the rest of eternity of what men decided to do and where they wanted to go. Don't ask me why. I think it's for our benefit, though, not necessarily his. I think it's for our benefit that we could see that and see what a gracious God. So that for 10 million years, we could, if we see the smoke over there and say, oh my goodness, I could have been there had it not been for him and his intervention in my life see we we got it reversed we think well it's a terrible place well people choose to go there god did not make that place for us he did not make it for man he made it for satan and for satan's followers and those who belong to satan he made it for satan he did not make it for us Instead, he extended his hand and made us in his image and breathed his breath within us. And we have been fighting and kicking with heel marks all along the way not to follow what his spirit has to say. Two times in the last, I'm going to say probably three weeks, I've had people tell me that they were told by somebody not to mention the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is divisive. He always brings division. And I think, God's not split personality. He's not divided. The division has always come, like when the Pharisees and the Sadducees were there. 
They were always trying to burn Paul at the stake, saying, you're bringing a division. He wasn't. He was bringing the Spirit. They were the ones that were upset. They were the ones that were causing division because they didn't have the Spirit. They didn't want to follow the Spirit. They didn't want to know the Spirit. They didn't want to hear of the Spirit. Why? Because they lose control. And somebody else is in control, and we just can't have that. So, if you hear someone make the statement, ah, oh, the Holy Spirit of God just brings division. Just brings. No, he didn't. Man's flesh brings that. Man's flesh that's resistant to God and hates the things of God and hates the things of the Spirit. Why? Because it puts a responsibility and burden upon you to become a son of God, a woman of God, a daughter of God, a child of God. It puts the burden upon you. And we like a religion that we have no burdens. We want to go give two turtle dove. Here, this ought to do. Now my sin's covered. I can do what I want. No, you can't. Your sin's covered by Jesus if you give him your body and make him your Lord and you become his servant. He's willing to die for that. He's not willing to die for an upstart world that spits in his face and goes and does its own thing and says that it's okay and they're still saved. He, he thinks, by whom? He died, he died for anyone that would accept him as the Messiah, as the king. He died for anyone that would do it his way. And then we have a track record that we've been going through in this book of Revelation of all those that didn't want to do it his way, and none of them made it. None. Not one. Not even somebody partially dressed. They had to walk the walk like he did, and talk the talk, and learn. He's looking for a family that really wants that. Planet Earth, boy, does it have a bunch of degenerates on it. And God's going to burn it up with the degenerates, deal with his enemies, and create something new and fresh. That's why we are his disciplined learners. We want to be his disciples. I don't want you to be my disciple. I'm, I'm real nervous over that. You say, well, I'm a courtesy disciple. Man, I'd, I'd, I'd excommunicate you. <laughs> no, you're not my disciple. You're a disciple of Jesus. You need to learn to sit at his feet. And you need to learn to hear his voice. And I'm just here to help assist you to learn how to do that and, and to show you those things that causes that to go in default where you can't hear and you can't see and you can't walk on with him. That's my, that's my only job here. Jesus does not command me. He says, you can surrender and be commanded if you want to and be my bond servant. I don't command you. If you want information from God, I'm one of his emissaries, and you come and I'll pray and he may have something to say about it. But if you don't want that information, you're not worthy of it. Why? Because we're supposed to be seeking information from God and the information the holders. Somebody asked me one time, he said, well, how do you know so much about God? Boy, there's been six or seven men in my life I hemmed up and would not let go until I put them in a lemon squeezer and squeezed everything out of God out of them that I could get until I could do it, until I learned it, until it was in me. But I'm the one that made the effort to do that. Why? Because they had something I didn't have. And I didn't cry and I didn't boo-hoo and say, well, you got something I, I don't have. <clears throat> Who do you think you are? No, I saw they had something. They could talk to God. They could hear God. They could walk with God. They could fellowship with God. They could do things I couldn't do. They could hear things I couldn't hear. And instead of getting mad about it and saying it doesn't exist, I chased them down. I befriended them. I worked for them. I worked for one guy for about two or three years just so I could be close and observe how he could hear God and how he could walk with God. Because he did it accurately. So are you a pursuer of him? Because if you are, there's little deposits of treasure in different men and women of God. And you're the one that has to make a decision. Would you want to extract that? It's there. It's water that God gave them and you can freely drink of it. And they'll freely give it. But you're the one that has to pursue it. God's not going to force it down your throat. <coughs> Revelation 22, 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Wow. Can you imagine water that can bring life? 
I mean, I'm going to get me a cup full of that and take an eyedropper and walk around, find me a desert and squeeze it out and watch a palm tree just poof. I needed a little shade. That water's supposed to bring life and make life. I mean, there's so many mysteries of God in the midst of everything he does. But this is a river, not of splashing water, although it may be water, but it's a river that causes, creates, breathes, makes life. And as clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God. That means God's directives and orders that he's giving out is bringing life, and we're supposed to grab hold of that life and do something with it so that he can create more life with it. Now, that's food for thought for you, and I know it's speculatory. There are some that just says it's a river that a canoe can go in. Oh, I'm sorry. God's a little bit bigger than canoeing. Yes, you may get there and get a canoe, but man, if you knew what was under the canoe, it's the same thing that's available right now through the Spirit of God, and it's rivers of living water that can burst up and flow out of you through the power of the Holy Spirit. But you've got to be filled with the Spirit. That was something else one of our patrons got involved with this week. Somebody telling him, you're not filled with the Spirit. There's no such thing. You can, can you speak in tongues? Oh, no. Ah. And fortunately, one of our members had been vaccinated. And vaccinated enough, it didn't affect them. Somebody, I can remember when I was in a Baptist church, 300 people. I loved every one of them and fellowshiped with them. And oh my goodness, I'd been walking with them when I was a young guy, about 18 or 19. And I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Every one of them became a Pharisee and approached me. You're doing a wicked thing. This is not right before God. It's not scriptural. And I began, the scripture began to open up to me. We're supposed to live for God. You don't have to do that. You're always saved. It doesn't matter what you do. I had every one of them in that church approach me and tell me what an audacious, evil thing it was for me to receive the Holy Spirit and that it didn't exist. And every manner of scripture thrown out there that had nothing to do with anything from the past, nor did it have anything to do with God's word. It was simply scripture taken out of context to prove that the Holy Spirit either didn't exist or I did something evil to receive it. And I wept because they told me, you're not supposed to have experience. There's something wrong with experience. Well, if there is, I can remember see, receiving Jesus when I was seven. And it's like he was there and it was an experience. And I went to my knees and I surrendered my life to him and I was ready to go to Africa and be a missionary and be shipped off and live in a mud hut. It was an experience. It was a life experience. He was real. He was standing there. And for somebody to tell me experience is not valid, the whole scripture, relational functionality, is experience. Only the Pharisees said, no experience, please. It's all about scripture. It's all about scripture. Jesus standing there. He's offering new experiences. They're working the crowd saying, oh, you shouldn't have a new experience. You shouldn't listen to this guy. Hey, we don't know where he's from, but we know how he does these miracles. You shouldn't have. And they would be coming and reporting, well, he healed me. Well, you shouldn't have had that experience. The blind man at the gate. How long have you been one of their disciples? How dare them heal you? How'd they do this? And he said, <laughs> the beggar that was paralyzed, crippled for 40 years, he said, you're the teachers and you don't know how he does it? They were quoting scripture. They were holders of the scripture. They're ambassadors of the scripture. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is we have to make a transfer of our mind into the spiritual world in order to make this journey. We've got to be converted to spiritual beings. And that's what the Holy Spirit has been sent for and the complete representation of the Godhead. And you're not going to know Jesus unless you're going to be able to walk in the Spirit because the Spirit was sent to introduce us to Jesus. Yes, we receive Jesus as our Savior. But after we receive Jesus as our Savior, He gave us a command to receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's now going to begin to show us the spiritual Jesus. Not the Jesus that just walked on the ground. Not the Jesus that's a baby in the manger. Because there's some of our religions, Jesus is just a baby in the manger. Oh, isn't it great? That he, there's some of our religions, that, well, he's hanging on the cross, which means he's powerless. And Jesus, we're supposed to be serving, walking with, fellowshipping with, through the Spirit, is alive. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to manifest him to us. So why wouldn't I want that? 
this pure river of living water is going to exude from this place. And I mean, before we get to that, the scripture says that the Holy Spirit comes and Jesus comes. We're supposed to have some of this water flowing out of us now. If it's flowing out of us, you might as well get a cup and drink it. <laughs> and you might as well share it. Because it's from the throne of God and the Lamb. I love it that it puts both of them in there. And it's from their thrones. And it says that it's righteous. And the Holy Spirit has always been recognized as the water of God that we drink. The anointing oil of the Spirit. The, the pureness of God. Matter of fact... He's going to end here in a little while, all those who are thirsty. Next passage of scripture, in the middle of the street and either side of the river was a tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And I don't know if you can see the, the little central park here. And the tree gets bigger. <laughs> and this is a part of it right here too, and it's joined. And it goes way on up. I didn't have a big enough slide to put it on. I don't think there's going to be a big enough camera to take a picture of it. I think it's going to be big enough that you can explore it for absolute eternity because it's a tree of life. And life is everlasting. And so the tree would stretch across every universe that there is. And just one little branch of it, it would probably take a half of eternity to climb on. Food for thought for you and you're exploring of some of the greatness of God and some of the things he has for us. And there shall be no more curse. The whole earth is cursed. The curse has not been lifted. The curse was not lifted from the face of the earth. God burnt up the earth because it was cursed and burnt up the universe and everything in it because it was cursed. And he makes a new one. <coughs> it has no curse. There's no more curse. All that had to be melted away in a fever and heat for the curse to be gone. Because Adam did something and Eve did something and Satan did something. Satan corrupted the heavens. Adam corrupted the things of the earth. Both were corrupted. Both were corrupted. When there's a, there's a mystery statement that has such revelation in it. It says, oh, you, Lucifer, you who, who walked amongst the fiery stones. Wow, what's the fiery stones? I can give you some conjecture. And yes, I'm probably expecting some letters to say, well, that's not theologically, anatomically correct. What's Jesus called? One of his titles the bright morning star. One of the fiery stones, maybe. And what about when God made all the stars of heaven and he danced them out and pranced them out and each one he named by name. And what about the angel that's standing in the midst of the sun that we saw in the chapter before this? What's his name? And why is he standing there? And what has he done in times past? And what does he presently do? Powerful enough angel to withstand the gravity and maybe juggle the sun around. And he's there to turn a switch on it so that the polars flip and we lose our heat and we end up with a darkened sun. Ah, scientists are just discovering that's fixing to happen. But what about the rest of the stars? It says that they all declare his glory. Are they some form of angel that's done something? I'm just throwing some things out there for you to think about. Because God makes the statement that there's fiery stones and Lucifer walked amongst them. And he also makes the statement that Jesus is a bright shining star and the morning star. And he makes statements about you and I that we are going to become like bright stars and that the angels would be bright stars. Now I know. To be anatomically correct, we have to say it's just a ball of gas and fire. Well, if it is, what's, what's an angel doing standing in the sun in one of these chapters? There's more to things that are going on out there than we know. We, just, we got this little bitty ant hill, and we're these little, little bitty red ants down in the hole. And we march out and grab a little bit of information about God and drag it back into our cave. And there's going to be a universe to explore. 
There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a great God that we finally will become connected with. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. I found that underlined uh, in my head, his servants. Because all through this, passage after passage, his servants in the book of Revelations, his servants will see him. His servants will be ready for him. His servants will work for him. His servants will carry him along. His servants will be with him. The, and matter of fact, in Re, the, when this whole thing started, we were in Revelation chapter 1. Remember the revelation of Jesus Christ? Whose revelation is? It's not John's. It's God the Father revealing things of the end time. You remember the disciples asked Jesus, well, when will that day be? And he said, you know, only the Father knows that. That's not even for the Son to know. Why? Because God's the executor of, this, every, of everything that's taking place. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. So we're, what's the whole book from? Came from? It's coming from Jesus. The whole book's coming from Jesus. The book of prophecy, it's a book of prophecy from Jesus. Such it above anything else than anyone else has spoken. To show, who's he going to show? His servants. This wasn't written to the world, this was written to his servants. And no wonder the world can't receive it, the flesh can't receive it. In many places in Latin American and African countries, and this is the first book they teach because it brings reality of God. But yet in our understanding, oh, it's too difficult, we shouldn't study it. No, hadn't it brought a revelation that Jesus is real and all these things are real? Well, it does that to a newborn babe in Christ. And he's going to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. See, John's standing there. Jesus is testifying about this. And John's bearing witness of it. Wouldn't it be cool if you get to heaven and you got to be a witness to something that God was doing? Most of the stories I've shared with you about God's great intervening in my life, I've just been a witness to something that Jesus was doing. And I've shared with you the testimony of things he was doing. Every healing that has come forth, come forth from him. All power, all authority was given to him. So every healing and everything that manifests itself is a manifestation of Jesus. And I've only been a witness of the things that he's done. <clears throat> he's a witness to all the things that he saw. Blessed be he who, he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Hears and keeps, for the time is near. Jesus is always near. He was near then. They were near an exit as far as physical death was concerned. John was when this was written. But this book was specifically written for the last days, which many do not believe in the last days, nor do they believe in the judgments of God, nor do they believe these things will happen. Luke 12, 35, Jesus speaking, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Not five minutes from now, let me, not let me clean the house, not let me get ready immediately. Jesus, when he knocks... He's expecting you to open the door in your underwear if necessary. Get the door open. Let him in. Blessed are those servants. Now he's gone to servants. Because he wants us to recognize he's in charge of the house. He's the master that comes. And when he comes, if you're his servant, when he comes... If he finds you watching, what, what, is, what are you going to be watching for? You're going to be watching for him. 
And if you're watching from him, you're expecting him to come. And if he's the master and the owner of everything, he's going to inquire about his goods that you've been placed in charge of here on earth, including your time and what you do with it, your purposes. He's going to inquire about that. And doesn't the master have the right to do that when he gets in? When he comes, will he find you watching? And surely I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Did you realize that's one of the first things that takes place is Jesus serving us if we have served him. I just, I can't imagine that. You remember Peter and Jesus washing everybody's feet and he, not so. Man, when I think of all the things he's done for me and all the stuff he's put up within me and, and now... He's going to serve me. I'm going to fall on the floor and beg him. Oh, no, please, Lord. No. Let this food just be a sacrifice. He's get up and get in your chair. <laughs> Why? He wants me to feel his intense love for all the service of my life to him. He came and laid his life down to serve us. And the first thing he wants to accomplish is to continue to show us to be a servant in this new kingdom that he's making. If he's going to model for us what we should be doing, shouldn't we be humble for eternity for our master served us when we first arrived? The king of kings and lord of lords stepped off of his throne to serve us. And I ask you, how do you like your bacon and eggs? Now, if you're Jewish, you might be upset about that. But if you're Christian... You know, he can sanctify anything. And when I look at most of us Christians, we are a bunch of hams. <laughs> we got all four hooves up in the trough, and we snort, and we grunt, and we groan. And what he's trying to transform us into is his little sheep. Sheep that will abide with him, sheep that will love him, sheep that will care for him. So, he says to you that he will gird up himself and have them sit down, have me and you sit down, and he will serve us. And if I should come in a second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. In other words, you're waiting for the master. That's your whole purpose in this life is waiting for the master. But know this that the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come. He would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect him. Because I know, I threw that in because some theologians said, well, it was just a parable. Well, if it was just a parable, why is all of a sudden he thrown himself into it, thrown the last day in there, and said he's coming and get ready? It's not a parable. He's talking directly about the end time and about our lives and how we're supposed to order our lives and how we're supposed to watch. Revelation 22, 4 and 5, and they shall see his face. Can you imagine that? For the first time we're going to see Jesus and God the Father sitting on the throne and we're going to see how that, that Trinity thing works. We're going to see them as one but yet three. We're going we're gonna, to we're, we're gonna be superimposed and meld into that. And understanding will go through our soul and we'll say, but of course a child should have known that. He told it to us as children that I'm three but I'm one. And many don't believe him. Some try to make him one. and Some say three and the other two aren't active. And some say two and the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. And some say, one, Jesus and the Father is not in control because he gave all power to Jesus. We will see him as one. And everything that he's done is graciousness for us. There should be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light. Eh, why the problem with that sentence structure? In the Greek, it can be seen that if I had a candle and I handed you the candle, I just gave you light. I gave it to you. You're now carrying the light. 
But most people don't even think about that. They just think about him being radiant, sitting on his throne, and I have to get out my suntan oil and sunglasses, and wow, this is cool. He's bright. He's, he's putting light on everything. It doesn't say, he said he's giving you light. That's not to say he's not going to light up the world. He is. Not going to light up the universe. He is. He's going to light up everything. And his city is high enough above the earth that the earth still turns and has seasons. It has seasons. The new earth has seasons is what scripture says. Twelve crops from the tree of life in their seasons. Matter of fact, God made that one of his principles that there would be seasons. That means there's going to be, sin there's going to be seasons of spiritual things throughout eternity. A constant change of newness and freshness. And his light with the earth turning... His servants are going to be in the city serving it. <clears throat> but yet there's still kings down on the earth. Now which do you want to be? A king on the earth? Or live on the earth? Have a plantation on the earth? Or do you want to be serving the great king in his city looking down at the earth? You know, I've spent enough time on earth. I'd like to spend the rest of eternity in his great city looking upon him. Serving him. Being apart with him. For the Lord, light, Lord gives them light and they shall reign forever. Who's they? And the whole subject is they shall see his face. That's his servants. They shall you see his face. They shall have his name written on their foreheads. They need no lamp, and they shall reign forever with him. God has some things for us to do. You remember, Adam was given charge over the earth, and he was supposed to reign, and he failed. God's intent is that man will still rule over earth, the new earth. He said, I'm going to make it new and fresh for you. You're not going to get a cursed one that you've got to rule over. I can't imagine that. I can tell you this, I had a dream one time and lasted for, I guess it's still ongoing because I still get new segments for, I don't know, 26 years now. I spent in that dream, in the dream itself, and the different segments, I made my way up into this valley called the Valley of Mysteries and wandered around and saw all the miracles and all the things like you do in charismatic land or Pentecostal land. The lower valleys were discoveries of things that were written on rocks. <laughs> that was me just being a scripture believer. Things written on rocks. Yeah, okay, it's written. But when I got up the valley, those things became life. I spent three and a half years there. After that, met a being and he said, your father waits. And I went with him. It took us months to get there. And after this journey that was about five years long, I stood in the Father's presence, my Lord's presence. He met me with bread and wine and set me at a table, and we talked for at least a half a century, it seemed like of him unraveling everything in my soul until I completely became a part of him. And he motioned his hand across the way and there was this porticole. That's, we have a pergola out back. Well, he has a round pergola, beautiful couch and coffee table you can put your feet on and servants to bring you drinks. And he said, let's sit for a while. I sat with him, it seemed like, for another hundred years. Till stars in my, were in my eyes and nothing but joy was in my soul. And after spending much time with him, because occasionally he would get up and somebody would come in injured and one guy had on the sword and a shield and he had an arrow through him and the Lord said, hang on just a second. He went over and moved the arrow, took this into this fiery place where he reworked the shield and gave the guy instructions. Here's how you avoid taking an arrow for the enemy. And then he came back. I could tell you a thousand things that went on during that dream. I burst into tears when he looked at me and he said, Curtis, 
I know you've worked hard in getting here, and I love being with you. But will you go back for your brother? I burst into tears. I wept, and I wept, and I wept, because he wants me to go back. I don't want to leave your presence. I have, I, I, I've yielded everything. I've given up everything. I, how can I live without you? I've been in your presence. And I remember in tears hanging my head down and just bawling and bawling and bawling and saying, Yes, Lord, I will go. I will go. So I, I don't look at this raining thing as something spectacular. I would rather be his servant. And bring him his afternoon tea if he drinks that. Then I would be in power of something. Because if I'm given an assignment, it takes time and effort. And it, it takes time. And he said, now, I'll be with you. But it's not the same being with him as I was in the dream. It's not the same. It is satisfying. It is pleasing. It is joyful. But there is nothing as joyful as being in his presence and seeing his face and communing with him. Nothing. I know there's a lot of people chasing that are spiritual power mongers. I let you have it. I'd rather sit with my father. But the fact still remains that he expects us to do something for him on planet Earth and in his city. He expects that. And he assigns that. And we will joyfully take those assignments. But I would suspect if you love him so much, he's going to give you an assignment closer to him so he can fill your desire of love that you have for him. That's why we are passionate about learning about not just who he is, but how do we walk with him? How do we hear him? How do we fall head over heels in love with him? How, how, can we, how can it be the passion of our life? You remember, this book started off to one of the churches. Is that you've lost your first love. I can remember when the Lord brought Jackie and I together, in which I couldn't recommend it to anyone. Although God's ways are best if somebody come to me and said, Well, God said I'm supposed to marry this person. Said, okay, we've got a plan for you. <laughs> I didn't know Jack and the Lord had given me a directive to marry this girl. I resisted with everything that was within me, and the Lord told her to marry me. A few weeks later, we were obedient to our Lord because we were that close to him that we could follow him. We had learned to abide with him. When we got married, we went to Arkansas. And we okay, we we obeyed you, Lord. What what do we do? We you, you're the one that brought us together. I mean, there was miracle after miracle after miracle, and it wasn't one of those phony miracles or made up miracles or something that happened here and this. And because of the two coincidences, that was God. Now this was real, miraculous stuff. And we went to a church there in Eureka Springs, and we just looked at each other. We don't know what to do. We we were obedient to you, Lord. What are we supposed to do? We, we, we got married. What are we, what are we supposed to do now, Lord? What are we supposed to do now? And I told the pastor the story of all the things, and his mouth falls open. He, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This is so God. I've never heard. Oh, my goodness. This is so God. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. And after five minutes of saying, I don't know what to tell you, but this is so God. All of a sudden, you can just see the light bulb. Well, of course of course, you're supposed to go fall in love. Jesus gives you an invitation. And he says, come with me, my bride. And you don't know him. You know something about him. You haven't been with him, but you know something about him. It's our eternal destiny to fall in love with him. It's our purpose. It should be head over heels. It was a command from the Lord to go fall in love. We have to keep that love fresh. We have to keep that life fresh. We have to keep that zeal fresh. We have to keep that, that, that zest for Him and His presence and His fellowship. It must be fresh. It must be first. And that's something we do. That's something we do. Once I receive the command, go fall in love. Now, what do I do to go fall in love? Well, I could do this for her. I could do this for her. I could do... See, I was doing everything for her. And guess what? She was doing everything for me. Why? Because that's what love is supposed to be. It's supposed to be giving. 
And you start giving yourself to the Lord and your time to the Lord and your mind to the Lord and your heart to the Lord. And you start filling yourself with his word and you start filling yourself with the romance of his presence and his fellowship and listen to him by the spirit and come and sit and sit under the waterfall. I used to, when I lived in Oklahoma, go out when the, the rains would come in the spring and the lake would be overflowing and a long spillway about a mile long, about six inches of water going over. It narrowed down to a creek and I knew ways to climb over the hills and get down in some canyons where that water was going and it was just pool after pool of cascading waterfalls. And I would sit under the waterfalls and it would just be raining down upon me. God's waiting for you to take time to find him in those places so the rivers of living water can flow over you through the power of his spirit and his fellowship and his presence to the point you don't want to leave. You want to be there. You want to be with him. You don't want anything else. We're the ones that make a decision to chase him to that extent so our lives are absolutely full if you chase him, you will not be disappointed. The early church lost its first love and he gave them a command. Do the things that you did at first. If you start over again and do the things that you did at first. When you first received Jesus, Jesus was first. You first received him, you fell in love with him. You first received him, you desired him. When you first received him, you wanted him. Something happened in the internal circuitry of you, of the spiritual person coming alive. And as that spiritual person was coming alive, then there was this, all these events that took place and the discovery of Scripture, how Scripture popped open and it became life to you. The scripture, he gives a command, stir yourself up. Stir yourself up. You can have my part of being a king down on earth. I just want to be in his throne room and gaze upon him. I want to once again sit upon the sofa with him and listen to all the things he has to say. I want to sit and drink bread and wine with him as he unwinds the universe. It captures my heart and captivates my mind that I want nothing else. Where all other things become superfluous other than him. He's calling you to that. And if you just want a spot as a king to reign, he's got that for you too. Become his servant. Become his servant out of loving him. Because there's this graduation thing that happens that Jesus said, since you've obeyed my commands and you're my servants, I now call you my friends. When I got the invitation at the table with him and on the couch, he called me his servant for probably the first 50 years, and then he called me his friend. My heart leapt when he called me his friend. I looked into his eyes to see, and sure enough, he really thought I was his friend. And for the first time in my life, I could feel, oh, you're my friend. You've been my friend my whole life. And I didn't know it. It's so far beyond just being a servant. It's so far beyond our understanding. But I find that too many people are brash running around saying, I'm Jesus' friend or he's my friend or we're all his friends. You got to be the servant first. And if you're not going to be a servant, you'll never be a friend. And if you're not going to be a servant, you're not going to be here in this place. Because all these things are for his servants. That follow his spirit. Remember the first seven letters, he ended every one of them. Every one of those churches, he had something to say about them. One of them got a good report card. The rest got a bad report card. The ones that got a bad report card, he started off this in the Greek. How do I express it? I know we catch the part about I've got feet that are brass and my eyes are fire, but there's a Greek word that says, I'm standing here. Why can't you see me anymore? It starts off every one of those letters. And then he gives a description of what they couldn't see anymore. And then he finishes that and says, okay, I've, gi I've given you all this and I've told you this and I sent an angel to tell you 
And if you can still hear in the Holy Spirit, then listen to what the Spirit has to say. They lost their abiding love and lost the consciousness of his presence in their lives. Our lives come alive with the consciousness that Jesus, you're here. You're not there, you're here. And we begin to respond to the living God that's in our midst. And we begin to fall in love with the living God that's in our midst. And we become breathless and filled with his joy. He extends his hand and he says, They shall see my face and his name will be written. Finally, it will be in your mind, every thought, every thought. I shared one time my last story. I was driving one day and I was having to learn volumes of law for a job I was taking with an insurance company. And, and when I say volumes, if, if we stacked up this room over to that wall that deep with legal material, I was having to memorize all that stuff, all the court cases and laws of different states and all that stuff concerning every case that had taken place all the way back from the 1600s when insurance was invented. Aren't all the terms and all that stuff? And I grieved because I, for years I'd only put the word in. I lived by listening to him. And now I felt crowded and cramped. And I cried out, oh God, what am I going to do? I've got to pour all this stuff in and it's so overpowering. And I was driving and I made this statement. I know, Lord, we only use 10% of our mind. Would you open up the other 90%? I, I need more storage. I'm out of space. <laughs> Inside my car, I heard this reverberating, rattling, loud. No! Didn't I say that that's reserved for me when I come? When I come, I will pour into you all my knowledge, all my revelation. And the 90% that's empty will be filled with my presence. The other 10% will be overflowed. And the 1% of the 1% that does evil can't even be found. Don't ask me to do such a thing. Yes, Lord, by <laughs> this time I'd pulled over beside and I wept. I wept. Why? Because it's one of those visitations from him. It's one of those real explanations that the 10% the that he gives us, that there's hope that it can be cleansed, it can be washed, and we can be filled with something that's beyond our understanding. And when this new city comes and this new kingdom comes and this new life comes and the new body comes and the new brain comes with it, oh my goodness. Oh, for the joy of being able to please him for eternity and be his servant for eternity. I pray that that's your hope in this life. For it will bring you the greatest joy that earth and heaven has to offer. Let's worship our Lord.